Hi. So today I'm going to be talking about Aristophanes' The Birds, or just birds, depending on which translation you're reading. Um, so this is a masterpiece of old comedy. Uh, an old comedy um, is intelligent comedy, I guess is a way of thinking about it. Um, so humor tends to derive from satire of uh, contemporary events, contemporary people, trends, things that the audience would recognize. Um, humor derives from wordplay. Humor derives from um, starting from a, an absurd premise and then treating that premise as though it's sort of straightforward and commonsensical. So there's a lot of irony, there's a lot of um, challenging of expectations, there's a lot of uh, reimagining the world and what the world can or should be. And Aristophanes is a master of this, and he does this in, in birds. Um, for full disclosure, I'm working from the R.H. Webb translation in this lovely uh, Bantam Classics edition of the complete plays of Aristophanes. And part of the reason that that matters is because different translators... So Aristophanes has a very distinct uh, writing style, and so different translators work with his language in different ways. One of the things he's very, very good at is wordplay and... Um, so the sound of his language and the way that it's, it gets rendered into English can either retain or lose shades of that meaning. But um, I want to talk about the, the satire primarily uh, in birds because it's a really interesting uh, sort of indirect satire in some ways. So the play starts with two Athenians, uh, Pistheterius, which means something like trusting friend or uh, reliable friend, and Eulipides, which means something like hopeful or hopeful one. Uh, so they have fled Athens because They've gotten tired of the rules, the regulations, the laws, and also the endless bickering over rules, regulations, and laws. So it's not just that they have to sort of follow these legal codes, it's that the Athenians delight in continually renegotiating these legal codes. And so what uh, these two characters, uh, Pistheteris and uh, Eulipides, are seeking is a sort of idyllic paradise of not necessarily not having to follow rules, but a place where maybe there are conventions that let them live fairly freely. Um, so right off the bat we start with this sort of rejection of Athens, this critique of Athens. And remember this play would have originally <coughs> sorry, would have originally been performed for Athenian audiences at major religious and civic festivals. So uh, Aristophanes is being slightly uh, slightly cheeky here, uh, which is very standard for him. But one of the things that's interesting about birds and its particular satire of Athens is that in contrast to a lot of his other plays, this is Aristophanes here is not being all that specific in terms of like, here's a reference to a specific person you as audience members know, let's all mock whoever it is. Um, it's a much it's a much more generic satire uh, than than some of his other plays, which is interesting here. So basically, what happens? Uh, these two guys, uh, Pistheterius and Euripides, go out and they they meet 
a king who, a human king, who has been transformed into a bird and has joined the wor world of the birds. Um, and they manage to convince him that uh, the birds should form their own civilization. They should found their own city-state in the air between humanity and the gods, humanity on Earth, the gods on Mount Olympus, um, and that by doing this, the birds can uh, reclaim, the birds as a, as a species can reclaim their ancestral right as the first gods or the true gods. Um, so they convince this king, this king uh, then sort of backs them up when they go in front of the rest of the birds and try and persuade them. And so the birds agree to form this, this city-state, um, which uh, Webb translates as Cuckoo Nebulopolis, something like this. Um, I've seen other translations of it that maybe something like Cuckoo Dreamland or Cuckoo Cloudland, but it's something that's meant to sort of convey both the the link to birds, obviously through the the cuckoo, but also this idea that this is a sort of ethereal place, this is an airy place, and this is a sort of utopic place in the sense that it doesn't really exist and it can't really exist. Um, so anyway, they, they, these two guys, especially Pistatarius, uh, convince the birds to build this city-state, which they, they start to do. Um, they're building walls in the sky between, again, humanity and the gods. Um, which becomes kind of a problem for the Olympian gods because they depend on the smoke from offerings, from human offerings, rising up to Olympus, and that's what sustains them. So, on the one hand, uh, the birds actually make a fairly easy sort of conversion of humanity, uh, who in the latter portion of the play seem to sort of view the bird city as a kind of bizarre novelty fad and like the poets start singing songs about it and everybody starts dressing like birds and they all, I don't know, humanity all sort of goes to look at this bird city and things like this. But the gods are in a more the gods are in a more uh, powerful position in terms of resisting this bird city, you would think, because the gods are, are supposed to be extremely powerful. Um, what ends up happening is that the gods send a delegation of three deities. Uh, Poseidon, Heracles, and um, Tribulus, who is not a proper Greek god. He's some sort of barbarian god that's worshipped in a sort of nearby land. Um, and he speaks this sort of mangled kind of Greek. Anyway, uh, I'll, I'll come back to, to them. But um, in order to get... Uh, the birds to sort of open their gates and let the smoke from sacrifices up to Olympus, um, the Olympian gods have to uh, acknowledge the birds as their supreme deities, and uh, Pistatarius uh, is allowed to marry royalty. Or, um, da -da 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 -da. Yeah, royalty, um, who brings with her Zeus's uh, thunderbolts, brings with her the right to uh, the heavenly throne, etc., etc. So basically, Pistatarius becomes the supreme god, supplanting Zeus, and the birds supplant the Olympians. So, 
on the one hand, this is a sort of utopian fantasy of, like, a fantastic city that gains uh, divinity through its own sort of good works and its own uh, spirit of uh, community, spirit of openness, etc., etc. But it's also a mockery of Athens, because in many ways... Uh, so in some ways, like the fact that uh, Athena is chosen as the patron goddess of Cuckoo Nebulopolis, uh, we have a sort of parody of Athens itself and of Athenian values. Um, we also have, in one of what I think is the most interesting passages, uh, we have a, a critique of democracy as such, and uh, the Athene the practices of the Athenians to try and preserve democracy. So when Poseidon shows up uh, with Heracles and Tribulus, uh, Tribulus is wearing his cloak wrong, or he's wearing his cloak sloppily. It's not 100% clear in the text. There's a lot you could do with it in performance. Um, but he, he's clearly not wearing his cloak like a Greek. Um, and so Poseidon says to him, What ails you, sir? Your cloak is all awry. A gentleman should wear it thus, with grace. What do you think you are? Les, uh, Lespodias? I don't know how to pronounce that name, I'm sorry. I also don't know what that name refers to, which is one of the other issues with uh, Aristophanes. But then he goes on and he says, democracy, what will it bring us to? Electing this to represent the gods, this being uh, Tribulus in his uh, ill-fitting or ungentlemanly worn cloak. Um, so we have that sort of, that brief sort of mention of democracy and this notion of like, democracy involves electing non-gentlemen to, to lead the government in a way that is not necessarily beneficial to society. And, I mean, Tri Tribulus doesn't do much in the play. He sort of gets bullied by Heracles into, uh, into siding with Heracles in the, the times when they when the gods sort of agree or disagree on whether or not to grant the bird's demands. But then, shortly after that, um, Pistaterius comes on, and they're cooking some birds, um, and, and Heracles asks, whose stuff is this you're cooking? Pistaterius answers, just some birds found guilty of an oligarchic plot against the state. Which is interesting in the context of Athenian democracy because there were continual oligarchic plots to overthrow democracy and to return Athens to a dictatorship or some sort of uh, rule by the aristocracy as opposed to a sort of popular rule divided among all the citizens, who, again, we want to keep in mind. Uh, was a very small fraction of the actual population of Athens, maybe about a quarter of the people who lived there, because it didn't include women, it didn't include slaves, um, it didn't include foreigners called metics, um, and so it, it involved, the citizens were only a very small group of people, but there were a lot of aristocratic citizens who were not super comfortable with democracy. So we've got that sort of satire of birds eating one another uh, because of disagreements about government, which is really a sort of ironic twist on the fact that Pistaterius comes on at the beginning of the play basically saying, I want to stop, I want to get out of Athens and stop having these conflicts, these debates over how, to, how we govern ourselves. Um, but the other component of um, 
of the satire that I want to talk about is we've got these two extended scenes where uh, basically we get sets of people showing up to try and do stuff. So the first time is when they're preparing to build the city and uh, Pistaterius is uh, leading a, a sacrifice to sort of ensure uh, the healthy and effective foundation of this new city-state. And this group of people come on. Um, I've lost the place where it is in the text, but that's okay. I can, I'll, I'll just summarize it for you. So we've got um, a, a soothsayer who comes on and basically says, Oh, I bring a prophecy that you have to give any soothsayer who shows up with this prophecy a cloak and a shirt and some nice food and sandals and all this stuff. Um, they have a poet come on who just sort of starts making up bad poetry and <laughs> they're desperate to get rid of him. So they give him a shirt and a vest and kick him out. Um, they have an inspector who shows up and wants to start sort of regulating things. They have um, a statute salesman who uh, has apparently come from this other city-state, this other so small city-state, and basically tries to sell Cuckoo Nebulopolis all of the laws that, that have come from that city-state. Um, and so this is a sort of generic satire of particular types. We have uh, poets, we have soothsayers, we have legal counselors, we have officials, uh, and so on and so on. So, sorry, you can come in. So, uh, the next time we have that uh, is later on. We have the city actually founded, and we have a, a group of people who come on. Um, so we have the the kid who wants to beat up his dad and believes that uh, this city state is the place to do it. Uh, we have the person, the, the lawyer, who wants wings so that he can fly uh, back and forth between courts to serve different uh, warrants and things like that, and then sort of get back to claim his client's property before they can come stop him, and so on and so on. So we have these satires of different types. Incidentally, the boy beating up his dad, uh, or who wants to beat up his dad, we've got clear sort of Oedipal uh, illusion there. But we've got these different types who come on and try and sort of ply their trades in dishonest or disingenuous ways. Um, and they all sort of get bought off or more commonly beaten up and sort of thrown out of the city. And so this is the, the, the other component of the satire here is sort of like Plato's Republic with the idea of like expelling the poets or, or whatever it is who don't fit into this ideal city. All of these shysters and, and people like this who plague contemporary Athens are getting expelled from Cuckoo Nebulopolis um, in order, again, to build this sort of utopian society. So again, it's a it's a a very intelligent comedy. Some of the challenges of it, as with uh, I think all of Aristophanes's plays, are that there are contemporary references and there are, are things that modern readers are not necessarily going to get. But that idea of trying to build a uh, a perfect society and then elevate that through bargaining with other powers, I think it is a very contemporary one.